Hi, this is Dr. Kathy McGuire of Creative Edge Focusing, and I am meeting here with uh, Edwin Roosh, and he is the director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy and Compassion. And I'll just let Edwin say hi, and then I'll introduce the exercise. Uh, hi, Kathy. Uh, glad to be here to do this exercise with you. Okay, so Edwin and I have just done an exercise called active listening, how to stop arguments and diffuse anger by just saying back what the person's saying with an emphasis on the feeling tone. Now, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate, we're gonna demonstrate an exercise called passive listening. Again, how to stop arguments and diffuse anger. But in this case, the participants do not even have to be trained in active listening. All the only agreement is that they're not going to interrupt each other. And not interrupting is a powerful intervention. It's the basic model for 12 step groups. It is the basic model for decision making and conflict resolution that the Quakers use. And it has been used by Native Americans. Uh, letting people speak without interruption lets people speak from their true inner experiencing rather from their automatic defensive sound bites. So if you can stop interrupting, you stop feeding the argument. You said, I said, you said, you said, you said, you said, that never goes anywhere. And you have the opportunity to learn something new from each other. And I think if we could have passive listening as a, a norm in our culture so that anybody, if you were at Walmart or somewhere and you saw two people arguing, you, it could be socially acceptable for you to go up to them and say, hey, let's try passive listening. And they would know what you meant. And they would back off, you know, sit down in chairs or just lean against the counters. You would use a timer and they would each have five minutes to say to each other, what's going on? It, it would save the world, I am pretty sure. So uh, here's the basics. And again, it's an exercise from my free e-course that you can sign up for. I have this timer here. We're not gonna use it because it's too noisy, but it is here to remind this is the most important thing. No interruption, timed equal turns. So. Basically, uh, people are going along in their life and I'm going to suddenly come at Edwin with something I want to argue about. And he, we've agreed ahead of time, and you need to agree ahead of time, on a word that someone can say that means we're having an argument, let's stop and do passive listening instead. So Edwin and I have agreed to use the word peace pipe. So... If either one of us felt like there was an argument happening, that person could just say, peace pipe, and it means we're gonna sit down, we're gonna get our timer, we're gonna take five minute turns, passive listening, non-interruption. So Edwin and I are gonna do that for just 20 minutes, two turns each. But if you were doing this with uh, someone in your family or a colleague, you would just keep exchanging non-interruption turns until something changes and shifts. And hopefully you will see that when people aren't being interrupted, they start to speak more from their heart and their real truth and begin to, to learn from each other. So there's another thing, if this, you're doing this in your relationship or you see other people arguing, if, especially if drugs or alcohol is involved in the argument, you might need to take a, a cooling off period before you try to do your non-interrupted terms. And if you're really angry, you might choose to take a cooling off anyway, but you're committed to coming back. Also, if, if someone is really, really angry, part of the rules are that you are going to yell at the wall, not at the other person. It's just a way of identifying and owning that this anger is your own. It's really not about the other person. It's your own reaction. So I just call that yell at the wall. And you'll also find if the other person's not reacting, it's hard to keep yelling. 
for very long. So uh, there's no physical contact allowed. Use your timer to keep the turns exactly even because that's a problem in arguments. Somebody wants to talk more and have the last word. And uh, if you guys cannot agree to sit down and take non-interruption passive listening turns, that's an indication of needing professional help to help you do that because it's like a basic human right to have an equal chance to say your, your piece. Okay. So here we go, and Edwin is going to do the timing of the five-minute turns, uh, but again, you need a timer, equal time. All right, so, so Edwin, I am still furious with you because you will not say that women are better at empathy than men, and there's hardly anything that women are ever acknowledged about being better at, and this is one, so I want you to say it. Peace pipe. Say it. <laughs> Peace pipe. Okay. All right. So I guess I'll go first. Okay. We're agreeing. We're going to have five minutes turns. You're going to get to have your five minutes to say whatever. And I'm bringing up the uh, clock here. And you have your five minutes now to fully express yourself any way that you would like to. And I'm going to just listen. Okay. Passive listening. You don't even have to reflect. And I am going to yell at the wall because I realize it's not fair to lay this all on Edwin. So I got a wall here. I don't know how you experience it at the other end of this, but pretend I'm yelling at the wall. Nobody will ever admit that women are better at anything. You can have all the scientific data in the world saying women are better drivers, all the statistics you want, and it doesn't matter. People still will say women are terrible drivers. And it's the same with this. Everybody knows that women are more empathic than men. Women's bodies, women are born to empathize with babies, to keep those babies alive. They've got to intuitively pick up what's going on in those babies. <laughs> it's such a fact, and it is so irritating to not have it acknowledged. And now I'm realizing it's hard to keep doing this for five minutes. I'm waiting for someone to argue back. So now I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> okay, what do I want to say besides yelling about that? Ah, oh, there's some fear there. Ah, oh, so big sigh just to have said that. It it matters because it's part of the oppression of women and. Again, this is one of these things I have been studying and talking about for 40 years, and it's almost impossible to get it seen. And that makes me crazy. And I've used the analogy. Is my time up? No, nope, it's three minutes. I have, uh, I've used the analogy in papers I've written that people say that an Eskimo can discriminate maybe 40 different kinds of snow. And... And I can believe that because that is functionally important in their world. They need to know, step on this snow, you're going to fall through versus uh, 40 different things. And I want to say that a woman, or now I'll say an empath, because there are 40% of men are like this also. An empath can distinguish and discriminate against 40 or more kinds of feeling tone, let's say. And, and that is the world that I live in, where I'm constantly making all those distinctions, just like that Eskimo. And, and I'm told by the larger culture, which I think is dominated by the more masculine way of seeing and thinking, that this isn't happening. And it's like I, I describe it as if I'm in a, under, in a pool of water and there's a frozen ice uh, surface above me and I cannot break through and get a breath because the dominant culture will not validate my reality, the way that I experience the world. 
<sighs> it's nice just to get this, to be able to say this. And I probably need to say it more length some other time, but it's not about feelings as emotions. This feeling, this empathic way of being that I think is almost in a woman's body, the way she's born, it is a sensitivity to the relational context of what's happening. That's what you feel. It's not, you don't feel anger, sadness. You feel, you get a bodily felt sense, as Jen Lynn says, of the whole uh, relational uh, experience, experiential world. Like you walk into a room and you feel the complexity of what's going on in a bodily way. And you, you couldn't just say it's any one feeling. That's why I like to use Jen Lynn's focusing because it helps me make words for these empathic experiences I'm constantly having. Uh, I'm wondering if I still have any time left. But 15 it, uh, seconds. <laughs> it is very painful. It's part of what I experience as the subtle oppression of women. The women who rise to the top are not these empathic feelers. They're the ones who are thinking and seeing the way the men are seeing. So it makes it hard to talk about it. Mm -hmm. okay. your time? Your five minutes? Edwin's turn. So I get five minutes now. Yay! <laughs> okay. Um, it, it's like, I don't know, there's, there's this thing about, uh, yeah, it's women, the women are all suppressed, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of tired of hearing about that. It's just, it's like the victim, you know, like we're the victims. I think it's really a larger picture that we live in a culture that is this hierarchical domineering culture. So men are just as oppressed through the system and the culture, you know, they might be doing more physical suppression of others, like in a domestic uh, situation, that they have the more uh, physical dominating, dominating part. But then the, the women are also doing different forms of domination and control, like I've mentioned before, about, you know, self-righteousness, like, I'm so right, you're so wrong. And so that's like not listening, not being empathic. There is, you know, a large part of, of analyzing, like I'm going to analyze you. You're a, you're a psychopath. You're a narcissist. You're a, you have bipolar disease. You know, you, you, like I see that in, with relatives, you know, somebody who's kind of problem person in the family. They, everybody's like analyzing and, and them and coming up with all these different uh, uh, analysis of what their problem is and kind of labeling them. Uh, there's the, uh, there's a kind of the sympathy, you know, part just kind of feeling sorry, oh, poor you, kind of having the other person be kind of a victim. Uh, I mean, there's just so many different ways of, of uh, this dominate, dominance kind of happening. And so I think it's, the men are suffering just as much, you know, in terms of, being suppressed, you know, it's like uh, a not feeling heard, and maybe there even there's like there's a someone that I remember listening to when I was doing empathic listening. He's from Africa, and he says in my culture the man has to keep all their emotions kind of pent up, but they have to think about other people in like his tribe. He was coming from a tribal African community, and you can't show emotion. Like when I showed, you know, like or you can't show kind of sensitivity or crying uh, that, uh, and his father would whack him, you know, if he had uh, any kind of fee uh, tears come up. So uh, it, it's like, it's not a, you know, male, female. I see it more as a, a culture that we live in this culture, you know, that's structured with uh, competition, you know, how we get, how do we elect our officials? Now we're in this situation where we have, you know, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, they're both like, you know, just attacking each other. You know, Hillary Clinton is saying, you know, the Republicans are my enemies. There's this, you know, half of the, half of Trump's supporters are deplorables. So she is demeaning them. 
you know, she is uh, calling them her enemy instead of saying, well, let's empathize. I want to empathize with ev all Trump supporters. And, you know, Trump is doing the same thing, you know, back too. So he's like, you know, name calling, he's demeaning, he's insulting, he's not listening to uh, the other side. So we have this uh, culture that is in this constant battle and it's structured as like a big fight club, right? It's like, it's like the, the media, like we just saw the, the debates um, a couple of days ago. And the media is like the fight club promoter. It's like big time wrestling. You know, the, the culture is like all worked up and they're like, like rah, rah for my guy, you know, it's, it, and uh, then the media is there kind of being the referee and kind of goading, you know, kind of prodding the, the two sides to battle it out. So you got this whole system that's kind of based on this competitive, domineering, unempathic, you know, it's like, I would like say, forget this, we need empathy circles, you know, let's, that everybody is included, you know, Donald Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, some of the community, maybe some of the media, that they sit together and have an empathic dialogue with each other. And the whole point is to start dialoguing with each other. So I'm just, it's the, I would say it's more the system, you know, and men can be just as empathic and, you know, maybe even more empathic than some women. So it's, it, it, it's just this whole gender thing doesn't, isn't really, really helpful. In, in that sense. So that was uh, five minutes. Okay. So I also realize it's not exactly f fair here because we've agreed Edwin is going to keep time. And I realize, well, he has to keep time during his own turn, which isn't quite the same as being free to just go on. So there's some benefit to using an automatic uh, timer. Anyway, and Edwin and I are both so trained in active listening, empathic listening, it's hard for me to not say him back so I can understand him. But that's not what we're modeling today, is you don't need any training. So, ah, so breathing. So you are saying about it being a cultural structure that is based on hierarchy and dominance and that men are suffering that oppression just as much as women. So it's not helpful to you and it's kind of a, a victim position for women to constantly be saying, uh, you're oppressing me, we're the ones who are suffering here. I, I can't help but want to say that. Back. <laughs> So, and I have some fear here. Uh, so I want to try to describe how I experienced this domination, and I'm going to describe it in terms of women who have dominated me in this same way. So we're going to get it out of men and women. And as we've discussed before, these are women who I think would be categorized if they took the Myers-Briggs type indicator as thinkers rather than feelers in terms of how they make decisions. And that the thinkers are innately more structured, or you've said systematic, logical, rational, and uh, tending toward hierarchical organization of things. And I'll say there that part of the thinker way, this, that thinkers think that they are totally rational and that what they are saying is irrefutable fact, which they call objective as compared to the feelers who are denigrated as being subjective. So the thinker lives in this world of uh, unshakable uh, belief in their own beliefs and opinions. They think these are facts and, and they denigrate 
the feelers who are more subjective in a positive way. From my point of view, a feeler senses into all the dynamics in a situation, the needs of everybody involved, and makes the best moral decision they can, given all the constraints in the situation. And that's what it means to be subjective. Uh, there's a, a great example that was given in terms of a, one of the crowning moments of my own life was when Carol Gilligan did some research. She worked with uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, who developed this scale of ethical behavior. And it was just noted that women statistically never rose to the highest levels of ethical behavior. It's like they were substandard. They could never, they never rose that in the test. And Carol Gilligan came up with another test, which was a test more of morality, that women were using a different standard. So the woman who's trying to decide whether to have an abortion doesn't just ap apply some ethical, objective, non-changing standard. She tries to take in everybody's needs in the situation, that child, that baby, that herself, her, uh, the partner, the culture, her. And th that's what subjectivity is. And it's a beautiful thing. But when a thinker interacts with me, when I'm trying to share my subjective feeling that there's something going on between us that doesn't feel good, they're likely to just say, well, I'm not experiencing any problem. It's just your problem. You know, mm -hmm. go yeah. away and get that fixed. This, it has nothing to do with me. We're not having a problem as far as I'm concerned. And there's a wonderful book by a woman, I think, a, I have to get my brain right now. I think it's Patricia Evans is her name, called The Verbally Abusive Relationship. And she tries to give dialogues where she tries to point out exactly where it is that the rational person completely undermines the subjective person and, and makes them crazy and totally uh, a fool. And it's, it's really easy to do. All you have to say is, uh, we don't have a problem here. But boom, you're totally invalidated. So that's what it feels like to be victimized in this. Mm -hmm. That's the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. And this is our last turn in terms of demonstration. We're just, mm -hmm. this is as far minutes. as we're going to go. So mm -hmm. Edwin has five minutes. Well, a couple of things are coming up for me. One is I wonder if we are being feeling in this discussion, like how feeling, are we being very, uh, are we being the, the, uh, are we being what we're criticizing in a sense? The nature of the dialogue that we're having itself. So I'm kind of questioning about that. Are we getting very analytical about our dialogue instead of being more uh, sensitive to the felt experience of it? So that's kind of one question that's coming up. The other one is when you said, Oh, it's not my problem. I had an example with that with someone from the academic world. We're working on the empathy circles. You know, we have some uh, problem come up, you know, and then I say, well, I would like a restorative empathy circle. I would like to call a, a dialogue to, to talk about this problem. And what I get is from a woman, academic, it's like, we don't, I don't have a problem. It's your problem. I don't need to talk because it's your problem. Everything's totally dismissed. And you want to tell me women are more empathic. Give me a break, really. I mean, I just, I just don't see it. And, you know, it's like, and it's like, you know, have example. I can go, I can go with example after example. My sister, her, you know, I, I did some uh, um, mediation with my sister and sister-in-law. And at the end of it, my sister comes into the point, and she has an awareness. She says, I withdraw from the situation. If there's like a conflict, I withdraw and pull back. And that's just her mode of dealing with a conflict, which is very frustrating because the person just disappears. So that's kind of one, and that's a block to empathy. The, the empathic approach would be, okay, I'm going to be present. 
I'm going to come, you know, in dialogue with you. I'm going to stay present. We're going to keep feeling into each other's experience until we've uh, worked through the issue that we have here. Then my sister-in-law in the conflict, her strategy is anger. She discovered, and she's very articulate about it, she, did, she felt she'd always been repressed as a, as a child. And then when she, there was a conflict in her family and she threw something against the, uh, a glass against the you know, fireplace you know, bricks and it shattered and everybody paid attention to her. And after that, she started cultivating anger as a way of making people you know, pay attention to her. And she also realizes that that's not an effective way going forward. So that is a block to empathy. So instead of listening, uh, maybe having some strategies like uh, you know, you're offering here with you know, peace pipe, I will listen. Uh, in, instead, it's like you know, throwing that anger into the mix and uh, you know, kind of dominating through that anger. Uh, you know, another person I know, it's self-righteousness, a woman. It's like, um, <clears throat> uh, I am right. Why can't you see how right I am? You know, it's like all Republicans are idiots, you know. And, and so it's this demeaning of just seeing one. So, and that's not, again, a block to empathy of feeling into where are Republicans? Or, you know, what are, the, what are they feeling? What's their experience? It's like, no, they're just... I'm right, they're totally wrong. So that's another block. And these are all, I could go down the list of, of women who have, I, that these are blocks. And I have my own blocks too. So, uh, and I, you know, men have plenty of blocks. You know, my, another uh, family members, it's another one, it's withdrawal. You know, just don't engage, stay totally detached, you know, from men and, and you know, my family. Maybe that was my way too, is to withdraw. So. Um, I think it's, it's better to say, how do we create more empathy and what are the strategies we create to, you know, to foster more empathy? And the thinker and the feeler part, what comes to mind is I saw a, a sculpture by Rodin. It's called The Thinker at the Gates of Hell. So it's the thinker kind of in his thinking position. And behind him is just the gates of hell and it's just people in a total... It's like Syria. Everybody's just fighting everybody else, and it's, you know, all hell is breaking loose. And he's the clear, focused one, but he's not empathizing. He's not feeling into the experience of the people who are in hell. He's detached, you know, which is unempathic in itself. So it's like a physical manifestation. This, I think, of some of the stuff you're talking about, and that's my time. All right. So... Uh, that's as far as we've gotten in the time that we've allotted to this. Uh, I hope you can at least see that it's different from just coming at each other and only each getting half a sentence said, it's this, it's that, it's you, it's me, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there's at least some chance for someone to say more about how it really is for them. Um, I noticed uh, just before this, Edwin and I did an active listening, empathic listening session, the same amount of time on the same topic. And uh, it's pretty satisfying to say the other person back, mm -hmm. not just to listen passively. And I think it also helps the speaker stay more on track. Every time they get to hear their words back, they can check it against their body and, and, uh, and stay on track. So, but this is what you can try. Uh, if you're having an argument with somebody and if you don't know empathic listening and they don't know empathic listening, just try peace pipe or find your own agreed upon word. Get a timer equal five minute turns are essential, equal turns, and just try to hear the other person and then have, know that you're gonna have your own time to say how it is for you, instead of an argument where nobody ever gets to say anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 
Uh, you have any comment you would like uh, to make, Edwin? Just so I, I feel the active listening was more satisfying. I feel a little bit more on edge. Like all these things are coming up, and I feel a bit more on edge than if I have that relational uh, quality to it. Yeah, um, I feel a listening. little more contentious still mm -hmm. also. Like, oh, he's not totally understanding me. or, uh, But it's better than... Uh, coming to blows <laughs> and a great free easy thing that anybody can try passive listening turns and again Edwin's website at www.cultureofempathy.com has a wealth of informational interviews uh, on the many aspects of empathy but also many demonstrations of active listening and restorative justice where you you learn, you use empathy to resolve conflict. So check that out. And also at my website at www.cefocusing.com, you can sign up for my free e-course that teaches you how to do the active or empathic listening skills, as well as teaching you how to do uh, Eugene Genlin's focusing, which is a way of really paying attention to yourself and your own experiencing and trying to really say more about how things are for you, learning about yourself. So thank you again. Thank you, Edwin. And thank you, listeners. Thank you. And uh, we'll sign off here.